Okay, thank you very much. It's great to be here um, and to have this audience come together. We've been working on this uh, conference for six months or so. And Sam, thanks you very much for your introduction. What I'm going to do is basically pick up where Sam left off and delve into the research that we have been uh, working on for the last two years, which is really to scope and understand the size and scale of the platform economy. So, um, you know, if you read the general media, you will find uh, various ways that people have packaged this to understand it, right? So one is the FANG grouping. Um, and I went and looked, you know, who came up with FANG? Well, apparently uh, Kramer did. Um, and so what is Kramer's interest? He's really interested in how you make money off of these things. And so he's cherry picked some that have done astronomically well, right? I mean, if you had invested in these companies five, six, seven years ago, you'd be doing incredibly well. So I don't know if uh, Kramer's on your smart list of people to follow, <laughs> but uh, you know, or it's post hoc, right? You know, they rose and then he's like, oh, let's just bundle up a few. Um, so that's one way to think about uh, the platforms. Another is the Frightful Five, and this is uh, uh, Farood Manju from the New York Times, and he's interested in a different perspective, right? Which are the social implications of platforms, and uh, both their market dominance potential, um, some of the issues related to data collection, um, some of the issues related to the kind of the social contract with labor. But these two actually I find um, quite incomplete and uh, not very satisfactory because there's a lot going on. And so what I'm going to share with you is an effort to really dig into this and go beyond these kind of characterizations or caricatures of the platform economy and really dig into fi figuring out what's going on uh, here. So what I'm going to share with you is our global platform survey. Um, and we have a paper out. Well, I think we've got a two. But I couldn't have done this on my own because I quickly realized it's a very big and complex space. And it's not just happening in the United States. It's happening all over the world. And to be able to understand those regional dynamics, um, I really needed partners. And so I went out and identified some of the leading platform scholars from all over the world and convinced them to join us in this effort. And so Jeff um, has helped me understand what's going on in North America. Annabelle Gower, who is a graduate of MIT um, and one of the leading uh, writers and thinkers in this space, uh, agreed to join this project. And so I was grateful for that. And then um, somebody helped me identify a fantastic lady in, uh, at Lagos Business School. And we've built a um, database of platforms in Africa, which I'll share a little bit with you about, which is fascinating. And then um, Chen Weiru. Um, is actually one of the leading scholars in China, but he's never published in English. And so the English-speaking audience really hasn't, no, doesn't know about him, but he's been a, an incredible resource um, on what's going on in China. And then we have Sanjit Paltadri, who's here with us today, and you'll hear uh, later speak. Um, and he's helped me understand what's going on in Southeast Asia and India. And we had an opportunity to go together there and get a feel for uh, what's happening. So anyway, um, this research was heavily dependent on their input and suggestions, because part of this is uh, you know data and numbers, but a lot of it is interpretation, right? So you're, these are two of the publications, and they're available online. And I have a few copies. If you're really interested, um, come see me, and I can give you a copy of uh, either of these two reports. The one is the global survey, and then I've been doing uh, regional deep dives. The first one I did was on Africa. So here's the top line. We had to have some sort of criteria. So we picked companies that have a um, billion dollars in market value or above. So I use that as my cutoff because there's a ton below that level. But just to get a sense of the size and scale, we identified 176 platforms in this space. And you can see the breakout here between the publicly traded platforms and the private. And it becomes very interesting because you know Airbnb and Uber get a huge amount of attention. But when you look up there at those bubbles, um, they're actually not that big. They've become sort of iconic as a representation of what platforms are, but from a business kind of impact or size and scale perspective, uh, they're not the only players, and they're not necessarily the biggest ones. Um, when you roll these companies all up, you get about $3 trillion in market capitalization, which is pretty big. So this is you know, significant. Um, we see hundreds of billions of dollars actually generated and exchanged on these platforms. So that's pretty big. Now, the numbers. For employment, um, you can't get numbers for employment for private, uh, privately traded 
uh, privately owned platforms. So this number comes from uh, the publicly traded, and it's not that big, it's 1.5 million. However, you have to realize that a lot of the activity and the value that's created by the platforms happens indirectly. So these guys indirectly employ millions more. And there's a lot of interest in a debate in this question. Uh, JP Morgan just came out with a report, which I find quite inadequate, but um, they're trying to put a label on it. The uh, BLS just got money to do um, a survey after 10 years, and Fabio Rosati, who's here, is going to speak a little bit about that as well. So anyway, so this is uh, a new phenomenon, and therefore, the, uh, the ways of organizing and thinking about the space are very nascent, and we're not quite there yet, but um, people are very interested in starting to work on it. So um, sectors. So where do platforms really penetrate? So um, from this 176 list, we're going to kind of code and figure out, you know, where are they the biggest players? And, so this is by number, not by value. Um, we have 47 in the so-unquote e-commerce space. And there's a wide range, right, from resellers all the way up to pure platforms like Amazon and Alibaba. Um, and then you have fintech. That surprised me. I, di I didn't expect to have as many fintech companies in this space, but 22. And then you've got business tools and services. And you can debate whether or not SurveyMonkey is a platform or not, or Dropbox. But uh, some people put them in there as platforms. Um, social, obviously, is quite big. Uh, media and messaging, transportation now is growing um, with the rise of Uber and Lyft and all of those companies. Uh, and then travel is very interesting. There's a lot of activity happening in the travel space. Real estate is another one that's quite interesting and growing. What's not on here is healthcare. Healthcare is actually, there's a lot of activity, but the companies are very small still. And so um, I think they will pump up, uh, jump up the list uh, in time, but they're not there. So I think what's interesting is who's on and who's off, and which ones are the rising uh, players to keep track of that. The other interesting thing is when you map this uh, globally to see where the activity is. And clearly, uh, the San Francisco Bay Area is the epicenter, right? There's just a ton of activity there. I identified 44 uh, companies with market valuations of a billion or more. So that means you're talking about $2 trillion in market cap. So you can understand why the housing prices are so high there, but also the innovation that's taking place there and why that network density is really important and why many companies now have listening posts there. Right? Now, whether or not they're fully exercising and taking advantage of that and understand how to do that, but you have tons of kind of traditional companies now that have offices. Um, even foreign companies now have their offices there. The other kind of pocket of activity um, is in Asia, which doesn't get a, as much attention in the media press, you know, if we read TechCrunch and all these other, because they're all hanging out in San Francisco and kind of, you know, interviewing all the folks out there and not as much in Asia. But I tell you, there's a lot of things happening in Asia, and that's revealed in this survey. The other thing that's very interesting is the paucity of activity in Europe. Now, there are platforms in Europe, but they tend to be provided by American companies. So Europe is a big consumer of platform services. However, they have not generated very many of their own platforms, which has interesting consequences. Kind of the two pockets are London and Berlin, uh, and then a smattering of other activity throughout the rest of the region. With this Brie exit, very interesting consequences for what does a startup scene in London mean, and how does it integrate back into uh, what's going on in Europe, if anything, right? Um, you can do deep dives in any one of these areas, and so, you know, China is obviously interesting. Beijing is a lot more active than you can imagine. There's a lot, a lot of activity. They have a huge base of population to tap, um, scales much bigger than even in the United States, um, and so there's a lot of activity. Shanghai, uh, Hangzhou, Shenzhen, and then you've got uh, a couple of others. So 64 platform companies just in China that have market valuations of a billion or more. That's pretty big, and they're innovating in ways, and China's doing stuff with supercomputer, machine learning, all the stuff that we hear about here, but we don't hear about as much of what that means. So um, thinking about what's going on in China, I think, is, is quite significant, and we ought to think about it, particularly given the fact that they create certain market entry barriers for uh, American companies to compete. So they're kind of incubating uh, their own um, activities, um, and the bridges to what degree they exist um, are quite interesting. Then you have places like Africa, as I mentioned. Um, as Jeff mentioned, I just 
ran through CGE a course on African entrepreneurs. It was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, and it was really interesting. And nobody's done this before. We didn't know what we were going to find. Um, we had, I think, 260 applications, and we narrowed that down to 50 students. Not all of them finished, but the ones that did, man, they're, they're really good. And uh, it's opened up a whole network of people. And it came, they came from all over Africa, South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania. And what you find when you look at the landscape in Africa is there's actually three pockets of activity. You have stuff happening in East Africa, and the most famous company there is M-Pesa. Um, you have a, quite a bit of activity in Southern Africa, really centered around Cape Town. Um, and the big company there that's quite influential is Naspers, which is very interesting. Most people don't know about Naspers, but Naspers made a big bet um, back in 2001 in a Chinese internet company called Tencent. They put $30 million or something into Tencent. That stake is now worth $66 billion. And so that has given Naspers the resources to go out. They've come to the United States. They've just announced several acquisitions uh, recently. So there's a venture fund that Naspers runs. Um, and their kind of angle on the market is, is that we understand emerging markets better. And that's where the activity is. So there's this crop of companies now that are popping up and saying, you know, fine, the advanced industrial country markets, we're not going to compete there. But there's a ton of activity happening. And if you believe in the rise of the middle class, in the emerging markets, that's where a lot of opportunity is. Um, so Africa is quite interesting, and I, uh, I have a paper that you're welcome to uh, look at on that. One of the things that emerged out of this literature as well is, is that we often think of a company and a platform, but um, there are groups of holding companies now that are emerging. And so I put up a couple of examples here where the management team or the CEO has decided, hey, platforms are pretty interesting. Why don't I build out a synergistic holding company that manages these uh, platforms? And so I would throw uh, um, SoftBank in that category. Masayoshi Son has invested heavily in Alibaba, in Yahoo Japan, Snapdeal. You know, so in India, he is as well. Um, now he's leveraging his telecoms um, sort of cash that in being able to leverage. So this may be a transition strategy. Uh, Coors Becker, who I just mentioned, who led Naspers, heavily invested in Tencent, made a ton of money off of that. And now he's investing um, across the world. He, he runs the largest classified uh, platform in the world called OX. Um, I don't have it up here for some reason. Conga, Redbus, um, et cetera. Um, obviously, Priceline, um, lots of acquisitions taking place in this space. We're seeing consolidation of these platforms um, and holding companies. Barry Dillard's got a whole slew of companies as well. And then you have kind of interesting companies emerging, uh, like Rocket Internet, which has this com company builder model. You know, one way to invest in platforms is have this arm's length kind of relationship where you just give them money and hope for the best. They go in and they provide all the back-end IT. They have this network. They actually help them identify staff. So it's a much more inclusive. Now, they take most of the upside. So the entrepreneur only gets like 10 or 15% of the stake in the company. But in an emerging market, you plug into these resource bases, and there's your likelihood of survival may be higher. So we're still experimenting with that. But uh, they own a ton of companies all over uh, the world. So I just wanted to throw that out um, to you. The other thing that's very interesting about the platform is that the profits from platforms to date have been very uneven when you look across it on a regional basis. So what I've done here is I've taken the running sum of the gross profits of the top uh, 50 or so uh, publicly traded platforms and sum them from 2012 to 2016, uh, Q2, and what you find is, is that the American platforms um, have been able to amass about $1.3 trillion in profits. It's a lot of money. Africa, about 12, and that's largely NASPERS. Um, Asia, uh, $233 billion. And Europe is quite stunning, only $87 billion. So what do you do with all those profits? One thing is you build fancy headquarters. And uh, I don't know, it was late at night one night, and I, I uh, Jeff didn't mention, but I actually did my master's degree at uh, MIT in the Urban Studies and Planning Department. I've always been interested in architecture, and you know, it's always nice to be in a really nice building like this one. 
uh, here so they feel good, right? Um, and hopefully get more productivity out of your workers or you know, give you your uh, trophy. And so here are some of the trophies that are being built around the world. My favorite is Salesforce. That's gonna be the tallest building uh, west of the Mississippi. That tells you something, right, about the CEO and founder of that company. Um, <laughs> So that's one way to spend it, but this is actually chump change compared to what they're doing elsewhere, right? So this is actually interesting as well, and, and this is, I've just scratched the surface and everybody wants to partner on a deeper dive on this. I think it's really valuable, which is to understand who's earning patents today. And you find that these platform companies now have popped to the top of the list. And this is just one year, 2014, um, these five, you know, it's kind of like the FANG uh, category, have 9,000 patents. You know, you don't think of that. Internet company, cool, social media, whatever. They're amassing platform uh, patents and other tools to make them competitive going forward. So I think this deserves a deeper dive. The other is um, investing in other companies. So this is a network map that I built looking at Google's investments. So Google's made, I don't know, three, three and a half, maybe even four billion dollars of investments over the last eight years or so. They've got several vehicles. They've got Google, Google Ventures, and Google Capital. And I was very interested in where are they putting their money? You know, is it in other platforms? Is it in technology? And what I based I could discern is is actually quite broadly spread across a bunch of different uh, dimensions. So energy, automotion, automotive, um, security, software, social networking, gaming, entertainment, apps, and transportation. Um, Google is, was the biggest investor in Uber. Most people don't know that, but it's interesting. Why? Well, Google Maps is absolutely critical to the success of Uber, right? So they made a relationship very, very early on. And so these ecosystems are emerging. Um, and it's interesting to see who's investing in what and what those relationships are. And what also you have to think about is what does that mean for the nation? So I think that if you think about platforms, they're actually becoming very important to a country's national system of innovation, right? So we used to look at manufacturing as a key component to the national system of innovation, how that worked, and then software. But platforms now are emerging. And you think about a company like uh, Facebook, it acquires a technology like Oculus, which is a box and it does some cool things. And, you know, Sony or Philips could have invented this as well. But what they don't have is the platform. So they can take that technology and suddenly they've got 1.3 billion people to go market it to. And so that creates some huge capabilities. So uh, this relationship between devices, the physical and the digital, uh, are pretty profound and have big influences for competitive advantage going forward. And then the profits going into the next round of uh, technology innovation. And these guys are uh, investing heavily in machine learning and AI and you know this whole next generation of uh, what is it, the uh, digital economy on steroids. So let me recap um, here. One, platform growth, we're seeing it all over. I think it's big, it's sizable, it is a, uh, it's a phenomenon um, that's worth looking at. So I agree with Kramer and uh, both also Farood uh, from the New York Times. Um, there's stuff happening locally. So all over the world, there are platform startups. We also are seeing the rise of multinational platform companies. Right, so um, you know the Googles and the Netflixes of the world, even the Airbnbs and the Ubers, are not just little interesting American startups. These are global corporations. They operate all over the world. Sam showed the slide. Most of them are in 200 countries around the world. So as they transition, it's going to be quite interesting to see the management challenges that they confront, but also their size and scale. And we may have a new debate about what is the multinational company and what does it mean. Um, both for us and uh, those countries in which they operate. <clears throat> Investment, these companies have strategic goals and ambitions and understanding them and how they're influencing not just um, their own strategic role but the uh, national systems of innovation I think are important. And then there is an anxiety about platforms and what they mean both at an individual level about data and data privacy but they're also being because of their impact beginning to impact a larger policy discussion and questions of uh, national competitiveness. And so we're seeing a reaction as I showed most of the profits to platforms are accruing to US not to Europe 
And so the European policymakers are reacting to that. And I think uh, there's a question about which direction do they go? Do they try to nurture their own? Do they try to block uh, the companies that are already existing? So there's a lot of interesting questions about how that reaction will play out. And I think that that is just a story that's just beginning. We're going to see that continue because these platforms accrete and they tend to uh, be become bigger and more influential and impactful going forward. And then finally, um, running the platforms themselves, we touched on that earlier, which is um, these are pretty new phenomenon, and they're different from a traditional firm. A lot of the value is created outside the boundaries of the firm, and so that opens up a whole new set of interesting management challenges. Is you know, if your content, you're you're running YouTube, and your content is generated by a bunch of people doing stuff, you know, they're not your employees, how do you manage that kind of thing? And the same if you're Airbnb, um, most of the, your value is created by hosts that are not your employees. And so how do you manage a world in which you're facilitating value creation, but you're not in control in the same way? And so thinking about that, um, I think, is uh, a big challenge. And I think um, currently the management, I guess, programs and curriculum haven't quite got up to speed on that. So there's a lot of work to be doing, and I know MIT is kind of cutting edge in this space, but um, I don't think MIT can do it alone. There's going to be lots of opportunities because this is such a big space. So with that, I guess I'll take uh, a few questions before we transition to our next session. Thanks. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, yes, thank you very much for the presentation. Two two part question. First is, what's next in the platform world? So we have seen a lot of these platforms go multi dimensional. So they're you know obviously uh, working with different parts uh, of the industry. And the second is, what have you seen that's successful across a lot of these that you think are lessons that can be learned? So what's next? Um, there's a geographic and a sector component. So geographically, we're just seeing the platforms go to places they're not. Um, and so places like Africa, most of the platforms that I showed there are just five years old. Um, and so I think the people realize this is a pretty powerful business model. Where are the places, where are the vacuums that we can go fill? So that's a big deal. And uh, I would say Southeast Asia is very hot. Um, India is very interesting. Um, so the emerging markets, to me, are a really interesting and big story. Um, the other is sectors. So if you notice, there's almost nothing on energy in there, but there's huge opportunity. Energy is a massive industry, but there's tremendous opportunity, I think, for platform plays to emerge in the energy space. Um, and we're going to actually hear from a CEO um, in a few minutes to talk about um, some of that potential. So the other is healthcare. Uh, if you notice, not many healthcare companies on the list that I showed. In fact, there were none. Um, but there's a lot of activity happening. And, and healthcare is also a huge sector with lots of data and uh, it's huge inefficiencies that platforms could come in and, and I think, really uh, do some, some serious, interesting innovation. So those would be two areas that I think are really um, ripe for opportunity. Yes, sir. Great presentation, thank you so much. And uh, d regarding Europe, did you uh, at least get a hint or identify some things, some factors that are uh, hindering their development? Yeah, well that's a big complex question and it's really come out in the research that we've done. I, I wasn't really anticipating that. Um, I thought it would be a bit more even. And so that begs the question of why. And I think a lot of people are asking, is it because they don't have the startup culture? Is it become because the American companies are already there and so there's no space for them to move into? Um, is it because they're more fragmented than you really realize, right? You've got this European Union, but the reality is, is if you're a French company and you start up a company, can you actually sell to German customers, you know? Well, and uh, actually we have some folks from Europe who are looking into these issues and um, I think maybe have some insights. But it's a, I think the challenge is, is a complex set of issues and it's not easily solved with one policy uh, intervention. And I think that's what they're grappling with is, is this going to be more complex? The real question is, is do they do it in a constructive way that's fast enough to catch up? Because they're far behind. You know, I'm thinking 15 years 
and just trying to set up some incubators in Brussels and you know Amsterdam and whatever, boy, you know you're dead then. And so does that? You know, I did a little bit of research on Airbus and Boeing back in the day, and uh, Europe woke up one day and said, oh, I don't think we like a world in which is just Boeing is our choice. And so they got together and they created Airbus, right? And so, you know, are platforms that important that you need to think about that scale of industrial policy to uh, to harness it? But I think the the results suggest that if you're not on the platform wave. Uh, you know, you're, you're going to be in trouble long term. Yes, sir. I'll take, I um, guess, one. How are we doing? Yeah, across your research, um, did you come across uh, established companies and or many of those that, that sort of jumped out? All of your examples were companies started in the last, you know, 15 yeah. years. Well, yeah, absent Microsoft. Sure. So um, you noticed IBM wasn't on my list. And I've been called out for that. Why isn't IBM on that list? Um, and you know you have to make a judgment call. There are quite a number of in, uh, traditional incumbent companies that are experimenting with platform companies. So I think of Daimler. They went out and created a company or a subsidiary called Movil, and Movil has been in kind of an acquisition mode to buy up little, um, I know, app-related matching car companies. And then you see. Uh, um, GM and Ford move into this space, and they're experimenting. So I wouldn't call them a platform company. Um, however, they've recognized, ooh, this is a space we need to learn more about. And that's happening all over the place. So um, there are not that many big traditional incumbents that aren't doing something in kind of experimenting or exploring opportunities uh, in this space. They just haven't, I, I wouldn't call them a platform business yet. Um, but we may see uh, an evolution in which they become. And so for doing research, it's really hard to figure out where you make those cutoffs. But you know, my view is that if you're not making at least 50% of their uh, revenues off of platforms, you can't really count them as a platform. So we, maybe we have to do a study on platform dabbling companies. OK, last question. Oh. Yes, please. Bearing point. Um, a lot of public sector companies and large organizations are also thinking about uh, platforms these days. Um, have you, do you have any information or data? On, uh, uh, have you done any research on public sector companies, how they're embracing the platform culture, given the huge When you say public, I mean, I, my list is okay. publicly traded companies. Are you talking about state-owned no, enterprises? Government organizations, okay. public sector. Um, public, I mean, there's there's huge sector. potential. There's po huge potential to increase the efficiency and yeah. save costs uh, by embracing the sure. by, by embracing the platform uh, culture. Uh, do you have any research information? In I that would talk? put them in the bucket of uh, platform dabblers. I think some of them are waking up. So, for example, there's a state-owned bank in China um, that is trying to copy Alibaba. And so um, I think some of the state-owned banks are, are playing around with payment platforms and also um, kind of e-commerce related platforms. So that's one example that pops up. So I think they're late to the game. They're looking at this, but none of them um, are doing something really, really substantial yet. But something definitely to watch because they make up a big part of the global economy still. OK, with that, I'm going to transition. Is our, there you are. We are going to have a really great um, CEO panel come up and talk about a very interesting set of platform companies that focus on work, right? these workplace platforms. And um, let me introduce Fabio Rosati, who is going to chair that session for us. Um, I've come to know Fabio over the last couple of years. And um, when I thought about putting a workplace platform together, his name just immediately jumped to mind because he was um, a key person in um, the, well, both leading Elance, which is a very large workplace platform, and merging it with Odesk uh, and bringing those two companies together to really create the largest workplace platform in the world. And um, I guess when he stepped down, they were doing about a billion dollars worth of transactions uh, globally. So very interesting perspective. Prior to um, leading these uh, companies, he was um, at Capgemini, where he had a, uh, um, a very active and interesting career in consulting. And uh, prior to that, um, you know, he did his, uh, his education at Georgetown Business School. So with that, I'm going to bring up Fabio, who will introduce his uh, panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.